Welcome to this one hour English lesson. Today, you're going to learn English with the news. We're going to read two different news articles together so you can learn a lot of advanced vocabulary, complex grammar, and correct pronunciation. Let's get started. Well, I'm sure you recognize Prince Harry, and you may know that he just released a memoir called Spare. That's what we're talking about today, and I'm sure that's what many people around the world are talking about right now. So let's read the headline. Prince Harry's memoir, Spare, which captures the ugly side of royal life, hits bookshelves. Now let's talk about the title of this memoir. A memoir is simply a book that talks about your own experience or memories, a memoir. Now, spare in English is an adjective. It's an adjective and it means extra or additional. That's not in use. So not in use. So that means that's available. That's not in use. That's available. For example, I could say, do you have an umbrella? Now, if I wanted to be more specific, I could say, do you have a spare umbrella? Remember, as an adjective, it comes before the noun and it just lets you know that I don't want your umbrella if you're using it. I want an additional umbrella that you're not using. So you might say, do you, do you have a spare pen? <laughs> if you're in a class and you're taking notes or you want to take notes and you don't have a pen, you could turn to someone and say, do you have a spare pen? So I would guess that spare in this context is referring to the fact that he is like the extra member of the royal family, not in use because there's no way he's ever going to become king because his older brother, William, is going to be king. So he's like the spare. That's what I would guess. I don't know if that's true or not. Now let's talk about this. Hits bookshelves. Hits bookshelves. So hit is our verb, to hit. It's being used in a different way, of course, because hit is this. That's the verb to hit. But to hit a bookshelf, when a product hits a location, it simply means to become available, to become available. So I'll write that out because it's used in the context of when a product hits a location, it becomes available. So you might ask, let's say a new iPhone was released or is going to be released. You might ask, when does the new iPhone hit the store, hit the shelves, hit the internet? Cause you can buy it online, right? Movies. When does that new movie hit the theaters become available in the theaters. So it's very commonly used. So when does his or his new memoir became available? Hit the bookshelves. All right, let's continue on. Prince Harry's memoir was released Tuesday. This is when it hit bookshelves Tuesday, not only offering Right now, when I see this, not only, I know that later on in the sentence, they're going to say, but also. Not only, but also, because those two go together. So let's find out where they say that. Not only offering new details on the British royal family's bitter internal feud after days of bombshell revelations and promotional interviews. Whoa, that was quite long, actually. Ah, but also describing. So we use this expression, not only, but also when we want to talk about two different benefits or features or points about one thing. So you might say the book not only talks about the royal family, 
but also talks about his relationship with Meghan Markle, his wife, for example. Not only, not only, and then you have your clause, but also, and then you have your second clause, your second point. So that's a very advanced structure. It's a nice structure. So you can practice using that in your own. We use this a lot in written English, but you can absolutely use it in spoken English as well. So we have not only, but also. Let's also look at this bitter, bitter, bitter. Bitter is an adjective. When someone is bitter, they're angry or upset about something that they just can't forget about. So let's say last week or two weeks ago, a friend didn't invite you to their party. So you're angry and upset. You were angry and upset at the time, but two weeks later, you're still angry and upset. So the anger and the feelings of being upset have lasted because of that event. That's when you would say, she's bitter. She's been angry and upset for a long (laughs) time. Angry and upset about a past event, I'll say. And you're still angry and upset now. So the family's bitter feud. A feud is a fight. It's another way of saying fight. Their feud. I do hear this quite a lot in the media to describe when two people are fighting. It could be a family. It could be within a company. It could be friends, celebrities. I often hear them describe it as a feud in the media, but honestly, in in my own speech, in speech with my friends, movies, I don't hear that a lot. It's I hear it more specifically in the media. In everyday context, we just say fight. The family's bitter internal fight. After days of bombshell revelations. Now, a bombshell is a announcement that has a really big impact. Because a bomb, imagine a bomb. Right? So imagine you deliver news to someone and there's a big impact of that. In this case, a revelation is information that wasn't available, secret information, and now it is available. And by describing it as a bombshell, it had a big impact. So that's a bombshell revelation. Just information being shared that has a very big impact. Let's continue on. But also describing how he fell headlong in love with his future wife, Meghan Markle. So this was quite a long paragraph, and then I summarized it in this very short paragraph. The media does that. They like to use additional adjectives to make it sound really important or entertaining when you can say the same thing in a more simple way. Okay, let's continue on. While many of the details from the book, titled Spare, have already been reported, its release at midnight Monday local time will allow the public to get their hands on a copy of a memoir filled with glimpses into a rarefied family riven by disagreement and distrust. When you get your hands on something. So notice the sentence structure. Our verb is the verb get one's hands. The one in this case is the subject they. So it's there as the possessive pronoun to get one's hands, plural hands on is our preposition and then something. When you get your hands on something, it just means that you have it. And we usually use this when the something might be difficult to to obtain 
or there's some sort of significance in obtaining. Let's say there were only 10 iPhones that hit the shelves and I was able to get my hands on one. I was able to obtain one and that is special or significant because there aren't many available. So here's the example sentence and remember, get one's hand. So you need to match the possessive pronoun to the subject. So I put that here for you as well. So you remember one's hands. Let's continue on. Okay, with glimpses into, glimpses into. When you glimpse at something, you look at something quickly and you don't necessarily see the whole thing. You just see a part of it. So let's say I'm driving. I might glimpse at a billboard. A billboard is just a poster that you see on a highway. So I'm driving and I glimpse at it. I can't stare at it or look at it for a long time because I'm driving. I have to pay attention to the road. So I might glimpse at it quickly. So to look at something quickly. So that, let me write that for you. So to glimpse, to glimpse at something is to look at something quickly. So in this context, if we get a glimpse into the royal family, it means we get to look at the royal family, but only briefly because we only get to see what the memoir shares with us, right? So that's what it's trying to let us know. We get to look at the royal family, but only a little bit. Rarified is an adjective and as an adjective, it means not ordinary. So of course the royal family is not ordinary. They're extraordinary. They're rarefied. So we use this as an adjective to describe the family. They're rarefied, the rarefied family. So if there is a company that is quite different from ordinary companies, you might say it's a rarefied company. For example, I don't think you'll use this adjective too much in your vocabulary, but just to understand the article, a rarefied family riven by disagreement. Riven by is another way of saying divided by, because you have your family as a whole. The family is not arguing. They're together. But if the family is divided riven by, it means the disagreement caused the family to separate, to become divided, riven by. So this is another way of saying divided by, divided by disagreement. Let's continue on. Some Britons flocked to bookshops overnight to be among the first to buy a copy of Spare. When you flock to a location, it describes when a large number of people go to a location, generally at or around the same time. So you might say that people flocked to the Apple store when the new iPhone hit the shelves. When the new iPhone hit hit the shelves. They flock too. So a large number of people and they generally went around the same time because the iPhone was released at a specific date and time. And that's when everybody went. So to flock to a large number of people. Let's continue on. Some of the book's most eye-catching passages include allegations that Harry's brother and heir to the throne, Prince William, physically attacked him during a dispute that his stepmother Camilla, the queen consort leaked private conversations to bolster her reputation and that his father, King Charles the third had pleaded with his sons to not make his final years a misery with their arguing. So remember we learned another word, another word for fighting. We could say with their arguing, with their fighting, 
with their feuding. That could be another word, with their feuding. So I'll leave that there. When something is eye-catching, it means that your eye is drawn to it. So your eye naturally goes to it. It is more interesting or it stands out more. It gets your attention. That's eye catching. So the passages, passage is just right now we're reading a passage of this article. So it's a piece of the article article and eye catching is most interesting parts, passages, most interesting. Now it could be another adjective, interesting, engaging, most entertaining, for example, but I'll just say most interesting. An allegation is when someone accuses someone else. You did this. That's my allegation against you. So Harry had allegations against his brother, William. You did this. That's what he said in the book. So he physically attacked him. So physical means that there was violence involved. He touched him. He maybe hit him. We don't know, but there's some sort of physicalness. Attacked him during a dispute. Dispute is another word for fight during a fight or an argument or again, a feud, <laughs> we could say. Camilla leaked. When you leak something, it's when you make it available, but it should not be available. So these private conversations, they're private for a reason. But if you leak them, it's when I say, oh, here's the conversation and I give it to you, but you shouldn't have it. So that is the verb to leak. This is a verb. I know it's a verb because it's conjugated in the past simple. So to make information available when it shouldn't be because it's private information. It's not supposed to be public. To bolster her reputation. Bolster in this sense is another way of saying to improve, to increase, to bolster her reputation, to improve. Improve or increase, but in this case, it's improved because you don't necessarily increase a reputation, but you can improve it. A lot of people don't like Camilla, right? She has a negative reputation. She wants to improve it, to bolster it. Now, I think to plead with someone is please don't, please don't. That's to plead with someone. To plead with his sons not to make his final years a misery. A misery would be terrible. A misery with their arguing, feuding, disputing, or fighting. Let's continue on. The publication of such a frank and revealing account is a near unprecedented event in the centuries old history of Britain's royals, who, as Harry has pointed out, double as both a family and national institution. The book has led to questions over whether it could deal lasting damage to the monarchy, even asking whether its future existence is now less certain. Okay, a frank and revealing account. Frank is another way of saying honest and honest and revealing. I'll just write this first. Honest revealing is when you share a lot of details. So that comes from the verb to reveal, which means to share with details. So to reveal, to reveal a lot of details or information to share. Share a lot of details or information. And then Frank means honest. An unprecedented event is an event that doesn't happen very often. It's never happened. It's unprecedented. Now, unprecedented on its own means that it's never happened before. But when you say near unprecedented, it means that 
it's almost. So near means almost in this sense. So it's implying that it's almost never happened before. And the event is sharing so much information about the royal family publicly, leaking that information, giving you a glimpse into the private life of the royals. Okay. And our final paragraph, Harry has said that he still wants a reconciliation with his family. When you have a reconciliation, it's when, so two parties, they're disputing, they're feuding, they're fighting. But if they reconcile, which is the verb to reconcile, is when they come back together as a family. So right now there's Prince Harry here and there's Prince William, Prince Charles, or King Charles here. They're divided, right? So to bring them back together, that's to reconcile. Reconciliation is just the noun of it, to reconcile. We use this a lot in a legal context because if a husband and wife, they separate, which is a legal event when they no longer want to be married. But then if they reconcile, it means they do want to be married again and they do not end their marriage. That's reconcile. So to become friendly again after a dispute, to reconcile. So he wants to reconcile. He wants a reconciliation with his family and believes one is possible, but asked whether he had burned his bridges with his father and brother. To burn one's bridge is an idiom. So imagine right now if I'm here and I want to get there and there's a bridge, I can easily go back and forth between the two, right? But if I burn the bridge, the bridge is no longer there. I can't get there, right? So it's when you act in a way that makes reconciliation impossible or act in a way that it's impossible to get to something else. So a lot of people are advised when you quit your job, don't burn your bridges because you want to be able to go back to that job in the future. How could you burn your bridges? Well, if you tell your boss, you were the worst employer I ever had. I hated working for you. You're a jerk. And you do something that makes it so your employer would never want to work with you again. So that bridge to that job is gone, right? So here I've added the definition and the example, don't burn your bridges when you quit. So be very polite, friendly, because you may need a reference from your company or you may want to go back to that company in the future. So that's the article. I'm sure there's a lot more interesting details about this new memoir, Spare. Are you going to read it? Share it in the comments if you plan on reading this memoir. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to read the article from start to finish in full so you can practice along with my pronunciation. Let's do that now. Prince Harry's memoir, Spare, which captures the ugly side of royal life, Hits bookshelves. Prince Harry's memoir was released Tuesday, not only offering new details on the British royal family's bitter internal feud after days of bombshell revelations and promotional interviews, but also describing how he fell headlong in love with his future wife, Meghan Markle. While many of the details from the book, titled Spare, have already been reported, its release at midnight Monday local time will allow the public to get their hands on a copy of a memoir filled with glimpses into a rarefied family riven by disagreement and distrust. Some Britons flock to bookshops overnight to be among the first to buy a copy of Spare. Some of the book's most eye-catching passages include allegations that Harry's brother and heir to the throne, Prince William, physically attacked him during a dispute. 
that his stepmother, Camilla, the queen consort, leaked private conversations to bolster her reputation and that his father, King Charles III, had pleaded with his sons to not make his final years a misery with their arguing. The publication of such a frank and revealing account is a near unprecedented event in the centuries old history of Britain's royals, who, as Harry has pointed out, double as both a family and national institution. The book has led to questions over whether it could deal lasting damage to the monarchy, even asking whether its future existence is now less certain. Harry has said that he still wants a reconciliation with his family and believes one is possible, but asked whether he had burned his bridges with his father and brother. Amazing job with that article. Now we're going to move on to the next article. Feel free to take a pause, get a cup of tea if you like, and let's continue on. Let me read the headline. Why Meghan Markle isn't attending King Charles III's coronation with Prince Harry. She's a mom first. Now right here, notice we have the word why. But let me ask you, is this headline a question? What do you think? No, it is not a question. And we know that because the order of the words. To be a question, first we would have the verb and then we would have the subject, Meghan Markle. So as a question, it would be, why isn't Meghan Markle attending the coronation? That is a question. But here, why Meghan Markle isn't attending the coronation is written more as a statement to introduce the reason. And this is the reason she's a mom first. So if I wanted to write this as one complete sentence, I could say the reason why Meghan Markle isn't attending the coronation is because she's a mom first. This would be the common way to write it. Here is just written as a headline to introduce the reason and then the reason is stated separately but all together this is what you would write let's continue on sitting this one out so notice this is just a thought on its own this isn't a full sentence as a full sentence i could say megan markle is sitting this one out. Now I need is because sitting is in my ing form. So I know is part of the present continuous as a full sentence. My sentence would start with the subject in this case, Meghan Markle, and then my verb. I know my verb is conjugated in the ing form. So it could be a gerund, but this isn't a gerund sentence. So I know it's the present continuous. Meghan Markle is sitting this one out. Now this is an expression to sit something out. And in this case, this one is the something and it represents the coronation. So to sit something out in this case, the coronation, it means to not involve yourself. So in this case, it's an event. So it would mean to not go to the event, but it could be perhaps a work project. And you might say, sorry, my schedule is full. I'm going to sit this one out, which means you're not going to involve yourself in the work project. So here I wrote the definition for you and I gave you an example as well. Now I did prepare a free lesson PDF so you can look in the description for the link to download the PDF that summarizes all of the notes. Let's continue. Meghan Markle won't be attending King Charles III's coronation with Prince Harry next month and her reason for skipping the ceremony. So skipping in this case means to not attend. We could also say her reason for sitting this one out has to do with her children. 
So again, to skip something is the same as saying to not attend something, to not attend something, but we do use this one to skip something more when there is an obligation of attending. To not attend something that you should or are required to attend. And if you're a university student, you might know this expression well, because you might say, I was tired, so I skipped my morning class. You skipped class. You didn't attend, but there is this requirement, or at least you should attend. There's some sense of obligation to attend. Whereas when you say, I'm going to sit this one out, there isn't really the same requirement to attend. So just be careful about that. You might say, I can't believe, I can't believe she skipped the meeting today. So in this case, it's probably not a good thing you skipped the meeting because you probably were required or you should have attended that meeting. So just be careful when you use skip something because there is that obligation there. As much as Megan appreciates the invite to the coronation, she wouldn't miss her son's birthday for the world. All right. So that's the reason why is her son's birthday, which makes sense. It's a valid reason to sit it out or to skip it. Would you agree with that reason? Now notice here, the invite, the invite. Now you might be thinking, but Jennifer invite is a verb. What is it doing here with an article in front of it? And you're right. Invite is a verb. I, let me give you an example. I didn't invite Meghan Markle to my <laughs> party. Okay. I didn't invite. Of course, this is a verb. Now in this case, I know it's not a verb because there's an article in front of it. Now in this case, it's being used as a noun. And I want you to notice my pronunciation invite the invite and listen to this one. I didn't invite invite. So with verbs, the syllable stress is on the second syllable invite, but with nouns, the syllable stress is on the first syllable invite. Using the noun invite is a very casual way of saying the word invitation. Of course, the, the noun is invitation invitation, but native speakers commonly shorten this to invite because it's just a lot shorter. So I could ask you, did you get my invite? Did you get my invite? Okay. And it's the same as invitation. Just remember the pronunciation invite the syllable stress on the first syllable. As much as Megan appreciates the invite to the coronation, she wouldn't miss her son's birthday for the world. An insider exclusively tells us weekly of the former actress, 41. So Megan Markle, if you didn't know, she is a former actress. So that's what this means of the former actress, 41. So Megan Markle is 41 years old and she's a former actress who shares son Archie three and daughter Lilibet 22 months with Harry 38. So Prince Harry is 38 years old. Despite being the Duchess of Sussex, Megan is a mom first. And this is the reason why she's skipping the coronation. She's sitting it out. Now, if you're enjoying this lesson, I hope you are. I want to tell you about the Finally Fluent Academy because this is my premium training program where we study native English speakers on YouTube, TV, movies, and the news so you can 
learn the natural expressions, learn how to use them correctly, get comfortable with fast paced native speakers, and ultimately become fluent in as little as 90 days. So you can look in the description for the link on how to become a member. All right, let's continue on. The date of the coronation, Saturday, May 6th, happens to coincide with Archie's fourth birthday. Now, talking about birthdays, we could say Archie turns four on May 6th. So we use the verb to turn when you talk about going from one age to the next age. So let's say it's in the future, it's July. Megan could say Archie just turned four because only a few weeks before it was his birthday. So in this case, it's in the past simple because it's a completed event. He already went from three to four. So that is how you can talk about age with your birthdays. You use the verb to turn. It's not clear what kind of plans the suits alum. Now this might confuse you. You have to know about Meghan Markle's acting history because remember she's a former actress and she was in the TV show Suits. It's a very good TV show if you haven't watched it. The TV show Suits. It's about lawyers, lawyers who wear these very expensive, fancy suits. Okay, and alum is short for the word alumni, alumni. Alumni is the word used when people complete their university studies. So when you graduate from a college, you then become an alumni of that college or university. Now, in this case, they're using it because she's completed her job on the show Suits. The show is no longer on the air. It's done. And so she's now an alum of the show Suits because she's completed it. Okay, so the Suits alum, who is Meghan Markle, <laughs> has made oh the plans that the Suits alum, Meghan Markle, has made for her eldest child's celebration. But the sources says, what do you notice about this? The sources says, that's not correct, right? Because the sources represents the subject they. There's more than one source. A source is a person who provides information, a source of information. So the person who shared this information about Meghan Markle with the magazine, that person is referred to as a source. But in this case, they're saying the sources. So there's more than one source. So it's they. So our verb should not have an S on it because the S would only be for the source. So it would be they say. To avoid confusion, I got rid of the S for you and now it's grammatically correct. But the source says she didn't want to spend it. This she represents Meghan Markle, not the source. She didn't want to spend it away from her son. And I know that because we know we're talking about the relationship between Meghan Markle and her son. Now you might be wondering, did a native English speaker make this grammar mistake? They didn't know the rule. No, absolutely not. Every native speaker knows how to conjugate their verbs like this. What happened is it's a typo. They just spelled the word wrong, most likely because originally it was singular and they probably first wrote the source says, but then later on, they probably realized, oh wait, there's more than one source and they changed it to the sources, but they forgot to change the verb. So we just call this a typo. So just remember, they say he or she says, all right, <laughs> let's continue. She feels very grateful to be included in such a special occasion by the Royal family and is glad that Harry can go and show support on behalf of their family. 
So this information is coming from the source, the person who is sharing this information about Meghan Markle, because it's not coming directly from Meghan Markle. The insider ads. So the insider, this is just another way of saying the source. More commonly, we would say the source. And again, remember that comes from source of information because that would be a common question. What's your source of information? What's your source of information? Which is asking where did this information come from? Now, an insider, if you have inside information, it means you have information that the general public does not have. So your friends and family have inside information about your life that your boss doesn't have or that I don't have, right? The general public does not have. But being the same day as Archie's birthday, un Fortunately, she's just going to have to miss out on this one. This is a great expression to miss out on something. And in this case, this one represents what? The coronation, right? To miss out on the coronation. It means that you don't use or you don't have the opportunity to experience something good or positive or beneficial. So we commonly use this in things like, I can't believe I missed out on the sale. So there was a sale at your favorite store, but you were sick that day or you were out of town that day. So you couldn't experience that sale. You couldn't use that sale. So you missed out on the sale, miss out. And then if you specify what the noun is, the sale, you have to use the preposition on as well. Otherwise you can say, I can't believe I missed out. Now, if your friend was just talking about the sale was amazing, I can't believe I missed out. Now it's obvious you're talking about the sale, so you don't have to specify the noun, but if you do specify the noun, you have to include the preposition on as well. A very common phrasal verb that native speakers use all the time. The palace announced on Wednesday, April 12th, that the Invictus Games founder, <laughs> who's Harry, this article assumes you know a lot about the royal family. <laughs> so Harry... Prince Harry, Meghan's husband, founded the Invictus Games. So he's the founder, the person who started the Invictus Games, would return to the UK for the festivities without his wife. Buckingham Palace is pleased to confirm that the Duke of Sussex, who is Harry, that's Harry's royal title, the Duke of Sussex, will attend the coronation service at Westminster Abbey on May 6, read a statement. The Duchess of Sussex, this is the royal title for Meghan Markle, the Duchess of Sussex will remain in California with Prince Archie and Princess Lilibet. Last month, us confirmed that the Duke of Sussex had been sent an invitation to the event, but at the time it wasn't clear whether he would attend. In January, the spare author, Prince Harry, the Duke of Sussex, the founder of the Invictus Games, is also the author of the book, The Spare. The spare author hinted that he was still on the fence about going. Okay, let's talk about two things here, hint and on the fence. So first let's talk about to hint. When you hint at something, it means you, you give some information to confirm something. I might say she hinted 
that she wasn't going to attend the party. Okay. Oh, and I could say she hinted that she was going to skip the party. Because remember, skip means to not attend, but we use it when, remember I said, we use it when there's an obligation, a requirement that you should attend. She hinted that she wasn't going to skip the party. So when you hint at something, you do not say, I'm not going to attend. No, you give some information that suggests, for example, I'm really busy right now. I'm really busy right now. I don't really like parties. I don't have anything to wear. I live really far from the party. My car isn't working right now. So if you're talking about the party and I say, oh, you know, I don't really like parties, you might think, well, that kind of sounds like you don't want to go or you're not going to go. So these are all the different ways I could hint that I'm going to skip the party without directly saying. So you indirectly give information that suggests what you're going to do. So that's to hint. Now to be on the fence, because notice our verb here is the verb to be on the fence, to be on the fence, to be on the fence. We use this idiom when you're unable to decide, oh, should I, shouldn't I, it would be good, but it could also be bad. You're on the fence. So you're unable to decide or simply you just have not decided for whatever reason you're on the fence. As an example, we're on the fence if Jane's a good fit for the promotion. This is not a good thing for, for Jane. <laughs> for Jane, this is not a very good thing because it means on the one hand, they want to promote Jane. She's a really great worker. But on the other hand, she might be missing some sort of skill or qualification. So they like her, but they also don't like her. They think she would be good, but they also think she might be bad. So they're on the fence. We're on the fence if Jane's a good fit for the promotion. Or a lot of times we use this as an answer. So... A friend could ask you, are you going to the party tonight? And you could reply back and say, I'm still on the fence. I'm still on the fence, which means you, you haven't decided you want to go because it will be really fun, but you have to work tomorrow and you don't have a lot of time. So you're on the fence. So at a previous time, we now know that Harry is attending the coronation, but at a previous time, he was on the fence about going. And that's the end of the article. So what I'll do is I'll go to the top and I'll read it from start to finish and you can follow along with my pronunciation. Why Meghan Markle isn't attending King Charles III's coronation with Prince Harry. She's a mom first. Sitting this one out. Meghan Markle won't be attending King Charles III's coronation with Prince Harry next month, and her reason for skipping the ceremony has to do with her children. As much as Meghan appreciates the invite to the coronation, she wouldn't miss her son's birthday for the world. An insider exclusively tells Us Weekly of the former actress, 41, who shares son Archie, 3, and daughter Lilibet, 22 months, with Harry, 38. Despite being the Duchess of Sussex, Meghan is a mom first. 
The date of the coronation, Saturday, May 6, happens to coincide with Archie's fourth birthday. It's not clear what kind of plans the Suits alum has made for her eldest child's celebration, but the sources say she didn't want to spend it away from her son. She feels very grateful to be included in such a special occasion by the royal family and is glad that Harry can go and show support on behalf of their family, the insider adds. But being the same day as Archie's birthday, unfortunately, she's just going to have to miss out on this one. The palace announced on Wednesday, April 12th, that the Invictus Games founder would return to the UK for the festivities without his wife. Buckingham Palace is pleased to confirm that the Duke of Sussex will attend the coronation service at Westminster Abbey on May 6th, read a statement. The Duchess of Sussex will remain in California with Prince Archie and Princess Lilibet. Last month, us confirmed that the Duke of Sussex had been sent an invitation to the event, but at the time, it wasn't clear whether he would attend. In January, the spare author hinted that he was still on the fence about going. Amazing job with this lesson. If you're up for it, I have another lesson right here that I know you're going to love. And make sure you get your free speaking guide where I share six tips on how to speak English fluently and confidently. You can get it from my website right here. And when you're ready, get started with your next lesson.